It is 12 o'clock, and uh, a couple people might be coming in later on, but we're just going to go ahead and start. Um, today, I have the distinct pleasure to introduce myself um, <laughs> as chair of, of uh, a paper that I have with Farron, um, Measuring Electoral Integrity. It's basically our introduction to what we've been doing for the last four months, um, creating a new data set of expert uh, expert perceptions of recent elections. And so today, before I wanted to get started, I, I wanted to make a couple announcements because I know that some people have to leave to go uh, teach class at 1 o'clock. So I wanted to cover uh, a few things first. And um, to begin with, we're not going to be having a seminar next week due to the strike. Um, so Rodney has been kind enough to agree to reschedule for the Tuesday after. So we're going to have uh, Rodney give the last talk in the Electoral Integrity Project's um, seminar series in two weeks. So we have one more to go. And thank you for, for, for working around uh, next Tuesday. Um, in the interim, we have two other talks, not um, officially related to the EIP, but the, the GIR's uh, colloquium series is next Wednesday um, uh, with a professor from Australian National University Amy uh, Katalinak um, presenting a paper, Port to Policy, Electoral Reform, and National Security in Japan from 1958 to 2009. That's one other alternative next week. And this week, uh, the Institute for um, Democracy and Human Rights has their lunchtime seminar series tomorrow um, from 12 to 1.30. And the former Lebanese Minister of Interior, Dr. Ziad Baroud, is going to be giving a talk in RC Mills in, in their boardroom. Um, the political challenges in the face of regional turmoil uh, in Lebanon. So there's two other things you guys can go ahead and, and attend. So with that, I guess I will go ahead and give you an overview of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, Farron and I are going to be sharing present, uh, presenter duties. I'm just going to start giving the overall rationale for the project, why we're why and how we try to uh, conceptualize um, electoral integrity. Um, get a little bit about the overall research design for the next four years, and then hand it over to Farron for the specific research design um, for, for the expert survey that we're going to be talking about today. And then I'll come back and, and give a little overview of the preliminary results for the data that we have collected so far, and conclude with uh, what, what we found so far, what, are what the limitations are that we can see, and the areas, there's definitely a lot of areas for future research, so we're definitely open for suggestions, comments, and critiques because this is the pilot stage. We're going to uh, another workshop at Harvard in a couple weeks. And any kind of suggestions uh, we'll definitely take into account when, before we move into the, into the main stage in, in May. So to begin with, just kind of an overview. Why measure electoral integrity? Why are we spending the um, better part of four years of our lives uh, focusing on this? I think there are uh, a number of different reasons that kind of stretch across a whole bunch of different um, research agendas. So even if your research is not directly applicable, I think it is of concern um, to a number of different issue areas. Um, as we can see in the United States uh, last year that I'm familiar with, but a bunch of other different conf uh, number of other different countries from Kenya, we have Zimbabwe with upcoming elections, Malaysia, um, there's a bunch of countries in which elections are considered to be uh, really crucial and sensitive times to the political stability of countries as well as the process of democratization. But we're still, uh, as researchers, at a relatively early stage at trying to get at some kind of consensus definition as to what we would consider elections with electoral integrity. What are the components, what are the most important parts uh, that go into um, it, uh, into understanding elections with electoral integrity from those that don't. Um, often we get this kind of face validity of this impulse <coughs> that overall an election wasn't free and fair, that didn't have integrity, but we're still in early stages to differentiating what are the most important parts theoretically to be able to understand uh, and what are the most uh, susceptible to either institutional weakness or manipulation by, by relevant actors. Um, and so to be able to differentiate, you're more likely to be able to get theoretically at what leads uh, elections to be able to fail, and then following on that, uh, there's some theoretical implications for scholars 
if we were if we're trying to understand what is a democracy, as we've seen with other lectures in the series, it's important to try to understand conceptually what we mean by democracy. Elections kind of play a really crucial point, uh, a crucial part in our understanding of what democracies are. Um, but we we still uh, by teasing out theoretically and empirically what are the different and most important factors of electoral integrity. It would help us be able to classify regime types, understand voting behavior, both by of individuals as well as by the contestants, um, and get better at that process of democratization that we've seen over the course of the semester with other talks. Um, what are the most important parts in order to, to, to understand when a country has really moved and become democratic? For practitioners, I think there are definitely some really interesting implications, um, and I know that PIP has a lot of connections with them. They're interested in getting their hands and, and seeing the results of these data. In order to try to understand um, where to allocate scarce resources for helping countries, is the, most, uh, is the area that you really need to focus on the, the mechanics of getting ballots from the voting place to be able to be counted? Is it uh, things that happen farther um, before election day in understanding how uh, electoral boundaries are drawn, how voters register. If you're gonna assist a country in trying to build their capacity in order to become a democracy and hold elections that have integrity, it should help practitioners, um, hopefully, uh, in our research to be able to understand where they, they might uh, most productively uh, assign their resources um, and thus prioritor uh, prioritize, prioritize where they intervene in particular countries. And also, uh, I, I'm an IR scholar, and I'm interested in understanding the causes of electoral violence and repression, which is often used by incumbents uh, in the lead up to uh, election day, as you can see with uh, concerns in Zimbabwe coming up. Oh, I guess she did hang on. So basically, the overall message that we want to say is electoral integrity, it's a broad topic. It incorporates a lot of different specific uh, phenomena, but in general it has a lot of really interesting implications both theoretically and empirically. Oh, and this won't work until you minimize. Okay. Right. So that is kind of the motivation. Understand why elections have, uh, are, should be considered free or fair, have electoral integrity, whatever term you want to, however you want to define it, when it fails, and what are the implications of that. Uh, moving forward. That's kind of the motivation. And it can be used both as a dependent variable as well as an independent variable. There's a lot of interesting um, interesting component parts and it fits just generally into the research design of the project overall. Pippa gave um, a description of the motivations for the project at the beginning of the semester. For those of you who might not have been here or just to refresh your memory, this is the overall process uh, of, of the project and theoretically um, how we're thinking about the electoral process. Starting with international principles, standards, and values for what should be considered as important in the electoral process. Making sure that everyone has one vote, it's a secret vote, and these votes uh, adequately reflect the, the preferences of the people that are actually participating. Um, the part that I'm really going to be focusing on is collecting a separate data set that I'll be talking about in a year or two, um, coding electoral laws. We're, we're focusing on perceptions, individual level analysis, uh, analyses of elections. But as to what leads uh, to those perceptions, the argument is that there's an institutional structure behind it. And so we start with these international norms. They're reflected in countries' domestic uh, electoral laws that we're also going to code. Then we shift to perceptions of laws and elections as they, as they occur. And that's where the PI fills in the perceptions of electoral integrity data set that we're presenting today. Um, and then we're going to be lo looking at how that maps on to other indicators, uh, how that electoral integrity affects various domestic and international phenomena. And then that leads to hopefully some really interesting uh, excuses to go to travel places and see uh, uh, the lessons that we've drawn from our empirical analyses, whether they match actual interventions with partner organizations on the ground in the running of actual elections. So that's kind of, we start at the macro 50,000 foot level and then we actually are going to get down to the nitty gritty um, and use a mixed method approach to really try to get a handle as to what the overall picture of electoral integrity is. 
And when you're judging our projects, as well as pretty much any other kind of research uh, projects, the way that we're thinking about it and concerns that we're trying to address when we're actually trying to define um, the, the research agenda for the project is worry about um, basically validity, both internal and uh, external, reliability of the, uh, the results and the legitimacy uh, of it to external actors. Uh, internal validity, it's basically whether uh, empirical measures reflect the underlying uh, theoretical concepts that we put forward, right? Because that's one of the easiest links to kind of break is you have these theoretical uh, ideas and empirical measures. Do they match? And what, whether we're actually measuring what we, th what we say that we're actually measuring and how much we actually measure. The struggle with these kind of surveys is if you ask too many questions, that gets at a more complex uh, picture of it. Um, but then you, can, you, know, you run the risk of having this kitchen sink approach in which you have 50 different measures with uh, which when you're asking experts who have busy lives like you to fill something out, you want to make sure that every question counts, that you're not overwhelming them and that they just go ahead and drop out. But then you also want to avoid the other uh, extreme that you have too minimal of a design, you ask too few questions, that you miss something important theoretically that what, uh, what you're actually trying to capture. So that's internal validity concerns that we have. External validity is to make sure that we're, what we're capturing uh, passes the smell test for whether what we find out about countries maps on to what other, uh, people can, uh, other people can be able to see, whether it matches with other existing indicators of, uh, of uh, election outcomes and integrity. Um, and we'll show you a bit uh, of our results that are optimistic about our measures of external validity. Um, reliability, we want to make sure that when we're asking questions that they can be comparable across regions and across time, that we don't have indications, uh, indicators that are not reliable. They, they're applicable to one particular case, but they're not generalizable. We want to make sure that what we're capturing is reliable across some very different institutional, cultural, and linguistic contexts. Lastly, legitimacy um, is that basically people buy it, right? That we think that what we're actually capturing is uh, persuasive and considered as having merit by, uh, by people like you and uh, practitioners as well as other academics. So that's the, the metrics that we're kind of setting ourselves. Before I go on, it's important to always kind of define your terms, of course. Uh, electoral integrity is a very general uh, kind of concept and many different definitions exist. Um, there's a good paper by Jorgen Eklet and Andy Reynolds that goes into much more theoretical depth as to um, the motivation for this project theoretically and uh, how they both uh, define it, as well as in um, uh, Pippa's book, chapters. She also provides uh, a definition that we actually use. But uh, definitions have been for, uh, put forward by international legal scholars, by um, public administration types, and, um, and by those who kind of uh, focus on democracy in general as to what elections are, are met with. Uh, integrity, each has limitations that so we'd be more than happy to go to in the Q&A, but I don't want to uh, put you guys to sleep earlier than I have to. What we're operating, uh, our operational definition of electoral integrity is international commitments and global norms endorsed by a series of conventions, getting at the international norm aspect to it, uh, with agreed principles applying universally to all countries worldwide and throughout the electoral cycle, including the pre-electoral period, the campaign on polling day and its aftermath. And it's important to kind of point out at this stage that we're not just looking at the election day. A lot of the literature that we're going to talk about later on is basically focused on the election day, the mechanics of that day, people parachute in, or you have domestic international observers focusing on that. Ours, we conceptualize it as being part of an overall cycle, and that it's, it's important to look at both after the aftermath, how you count, and whether it's perceived as being legitimate and the, and the loser accepts it, but also, and most importantly, um, at least in my initial thinking, is the pre-election. All these uh, institutional structures that are going to be coding later on, how that can be, uh, the field can be tilted long before the election day and that most people haven't really looked at. So our, uh, our view of electoral integrity is more encompassing and includes these different, uh, these different um, parts of the electoral cycle that other definitions uh, don't really include. Okay.
So in trying to get at our operational uh, measures that are more inclusive and include uh, these, different, uh, these different phases of the electoral cycle, we have a bunch of, um, a bunch of different measures. Did you print them out? Yes. OK. We have handouts of the wording of the, of the uh, questionnaire, if you're interested. I'm more than happy to hand them out. But as a brief snapshot, we look at a bunch of, elect uh, a bunch of indicators in the pre-election period focusing on how parties and candidates are nominated for, uh, to get on the ballot, the electoral laws and how they're, how they're drawn, how electoral boundaries are drawn. This is not the case across all countries. Some countries have national. Um, but for those, like in the United States and where there's definitely difference across boundaries, we code, uh, we ask questions about that, how voters are registered, and questions about the overall perceptions of the electoral, uh, electoral authorities. During the campaign, we look at how different parties and candidates have access to uh, um, getting their word out to voters to make sure that uh, voters have an opportunity to find out what the different policy positions are, their access to finance, and um, how the campaigns are actually run, polling day, how the polling went out, uh, how the ballots were counted, um, how the results were uh, promulgated, and how any kind of disputes are actually handled. So we have uh, 11 sections in the overall expert survey capturing a bunch of these different sections. And I guess with that, I'll hand, hand over the floor to Farron, and he's going to go into more detail about the survey. Right. Can you pass this one? Right. Yeah. Thanks. So as Rich was mentioning, in order to, to capture the whole funnel, like the, the whole three sections, we are uh, including uh, 49 substantive questions, which, uh, yeah, make the, make the survey long, uh, but less long than, than another or previous service that we've been working on. I would say comprehensive. Comprehensive, yeah, <laughs> thanks. Comprehensive. And we have ele uh, 11, 11 sections, right? Almost the good thing, though, that we've tried to, to, to be very specific is try to uniformize all of them, all, all of the questions following the same, the same kind of framing and the same sort of response. So this is where we've been using a uh, Likert five-point scale. And normally this being strongly agree, strongly disagree. Then for the analysis, we've turned them up, right? What was negative, we put it into positive, but you know, very, very straightforward. We also have uh, included additional background items, such as if, well, obviously, if the expert is domestic or international, whether if he voted or didn't vote, uh, his or her uh, placement in the ideological scale, uh, his or her uh, skill, uh, sorry, educational level or educational attainment, and some other and some other questions. Besides, and before getting into those additional background questions, we also have included uh, anchoring vignettes, uh, which are six in the, there you got only included five, sorry guys, I just misread this morning. So there are six uh, that we still have not exploited. Uh, they are public and we'll try to, to, to figure it out in the, in the future. And these we assume that will be very helpful for us in order to compare with previous, sorry, with, in order to compare between regions or among countries, as, as Richard was mentioning before, in order to, to you know, try to see what's, how, our, how our findings stand <coughs> and how our experts consider which are the biggest <coughs> problems all around. That would be the first part. Um, and then something very important that we want to mention is that all the information, uh, this, the questionnaire right now is available in the website, so you just can download it. You can download it. By the way, some of you, if not, already will be receiving uh, emails considering you as an expert. I will go on right now on what is an expert in order to fill the, the survey in the, in the next coming months for the next coming elections. And, and that's why we want to explain. But we want to stress that this is public and the data is going to be publicly available really soon, <coughs> in fact, very soon. The pilot data will the be pilot available date, right? at the end of next week. So that's something that we wanted to, to, to stress. So uh, why, why we want to do an, an expert survey and, and, and why do we consider that monitor or election observers, monitors are, are not good enough? I mean, they are very useful. They, they provide us with huge amount of information. But to our understanding, they are missing some point. As before, Rich was mentioning, uh, Elklit and, and Reynolds point out, and this is literally, as they say, that they, they judge on the basis of large, largely impressionistic and incomplete evidence, and they provide another, another, another argument, which is sometimes that 
the observer's missions are kind of politicized. politicized. Mm -hmm. So our argument is like, all right, so we should complement with some other with some other expertise, right? Not only from people who is there. Now, we're considering experts, and we'll define them later, because uh, international observers only or normally focus on the election day. So you know, you go there, you are sent there for 10 days or 20 days, but then you, you just don't cannot observe the whole process, right? So there may be things that, that, that you are losing. Second part, uh, we may consider that experts, the domestic expert perception may matter. So ideally, although they should be included. And, sorry guys, and yeah, and we also need to include, um, by including an expert, there are some other, there are some times that in order to get data, we only have, can get data through, 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 through surveys. Literally, because there's like, you know, for instance, in the cases of corruption, it's really hard to, to, to see whether there is corruption unless you ask, right? So it's the same with electoral malpractice. If there is something that is going wrong, it's really hard unless you ask somebody tells you, right? This is why we're also using, we're also using uh, experts. Media coverage, we believe it also may have uh, systematic biases, normally towards, uh, towards electoral violence, so this is why Again, since we want to be also go the completely comprehensive, we want to include the pre, the during, and the after, and the after, uh, and the after, uh, after the election date uh, results, right? And something very important that may be included in, in a selection, if the country does, normally countries invite the experts, right? So if you don't invite the expert, if you don't invite the experts, then who is going to observe that election? So again, our project is trying to include all the countries those who invite experts and those who do not invite experts. So at least, ideally, we're going to try to get the whole countries of the world except seven, which will tell you, or eight, which will tell you now why, right? Uh, expert surveys is, uh, it's been very useful or it's been very widely used in the last, in the last years uh, in many, many uh, kind of disciplines from environmental degradation to nuclear accidents, but again, uh, we're increasing it's very increasingly used in social sciences. If you go, guys, to um, Kaufman and Art, for instance, in the World Bank, they are using those sort of surveys. Um, quality of uh, varieties of democracy, also by Kopech and by Mike Kopech and somebody else. But now, now I can't a, a lot of co-authors. And a lot of co-authors yeah. are also using uh, uh, survey expert surveys. And it's also using, for instance, when we have to place the experts or the the, part, the political parties in the, on the scales, right? So it's been it's been widely used. Um, why are we using also those? Because normally we are we want to measure the perceived quality of elections, but what, by using an expert, we're way more available to ask very very technical questions. So it's something that it's very clear when you're some of you have guys been running surveys. You don't want to make very technical questions to your respondents because. The, the, the increment of the don't knows or not applicable are gonna are gonna are gonna raise right. So we need to 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 ask very technical questions in some cases like like boundaries like funding like if there was a party excluded from the ballot and normally the public doesn't follow with so much of attention. So there are two things: first, information that an expert has compared to the public, and second, the kind of information. Uh, and second, the kind of the information and the availability of such information and the knowledge that the, the expert has, right? So these are some variables that we want to include. We also assume that expert scholars are more likely to be impartial and independent, that this is not to mean that they don't have their own political stances, but that they are able to understand when a country, sorry, when a political party has been banned or has not been banned. That doesn't matter if we're their, their opinion, right? Um, the good thing also is that we can compare, although we can make comparisons between experts domestic and international. So this, if we are aiming, if we achieve at some point to get, and we'll talk this in, in very, very shortly, if we, are able, if we achieve to gain a, a regular, a balanced uh, number of domestic and international experts, we will be able to compare among them and to see whether they're the international experts have a different perspective than the domestic observers, right? These, sorry, experts, right? In order to see which are the differences. And finally, we're gonna be able to do this through time. And a third part is through the World Value Survey, we're gonna be able to 
to, to compare our expert surveys, our expert responses with the responses with the responses from the public. All right. So we have uh, made sure that some of the questions that are already included in the questionnaire uh, match perfectly the web value survey. Right. So we can be able to see which are which are the, the degrees of agreements and 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 these agreements. All right. How we define an expert, very broadly, a political scientist or other social scientist, by this we mean sociologists, lawyers, at some point economists, uh, who, have, who has written about or who has an other demonstrated knowledge of the electoral process in a particular country. By this, so what we use is being either you have or you hold a university employment, all right? You are a membership of a relevant research group, professional network, such as APSA or, or some others. And you have, and you have had publications regarding this country, right? In specific topic books, academic journals, conference conference papers, and this is very important, guys. That we have, that we that we just uh, we're going back into the second. But we've been trying to be as encompassing as possible. Some other previous studies that we've seen regarding and the selection of the experts, they got on people who have already published in, you know, a very good journal like American Journal of Political Science, European. ACPR, big, big journals. What we try to do is not being so demanding in that regard, and so, you know, not all the scholars aim to publish in big journals, not even those who aim achieve it. So there are some other journals that are not JCR indexed, or, you know, they don't have such an, in, an impact factor. So we need to get those other people who also understand about the elections, but they are not widely recognizable, right? We have tried to contact, we contacted at least 40 experts per country. This has varied in, in, in certain cases, but now you'll see the figures that we have already for every single country and, and you can and you can compare. Which sources well how we which sources we've been using, uh, you you can sell them here. But let me explain you how we started. Normally in other expert studies what they normally do is they go first to the IPSA or the APSA uh, directory and from there you know they draw some names and from there they go on. But well, we started this a bit differently. We went through the countries and this is important because we have included countries like Sierra Leona and the, Sierra Leone and the Ukraine and we went to their universities. All right? Went to the universities, went to their political science or social sciences, it really depends on the country departments and from there try to see which were the teachers or the professors who had. Now you will say, all right, Ferran, who of you speak Ukrainian? It's nobody. But there is something that is known as Google Translator, and it turns out it really works, which I was really surprised. So, in, seriously, so you can, try, you can try to obtain lots of people who have published regarding the Ukraine through their own websites, all right? Now, this doesn't allow, or this doesn't imply that those guys are gonna have are going to have uh, an email uh, an email address. This is why it's, you guys probably have seen us. Uh, Sandra, who is back there, Max, who's been around there, myself, and Rich, hours and hours in front of a computer gathering experts. We were talking about experts. So it's because, again, you may try, you may find the university, you may find the department, you, find, you may find the names, but then those guys have names, but they don't have an email address. And that's where you have to, again, go, go and look around. All right, that's the very first step. Once, and you will see, all right, but this, so this has been pretty much could work a, a bit for the Ukraine, Belarus, but then there have been other countries, which has been the next step. Well, the next step has been regularly going through Web of Science or Google Scholar and, you know, typing Ukrainian elections or Sierra Leone elections, and then we got tons of, uh, well, tons, we got some scholars <laughs> publishing regarding some of the countries, all right? Now, obviously, this has had an effect on, on the ratio between domestic and international experts that you will see right now. The, it's on the, there are on the paper, and not, right now you'll see you'll see the you'll see the figures. And finally, we've seen also we've also used at the, the last resource the APSA, IPSA, the directories membership, right? So who has been an expert on public opinion in Western Europe, or who is an expert on the elections in in in, in Russia? So we'll go through that. Besides, on the survey. On the questionnaire, we are asking if our respondent is so kind to give us uh, some of some names of somebody that he or she knows about the country, that knows something about the country or knows about the elections of that country, right? And 
pretty surprisingly, they've been pretty kind and they've been giving us names and email addresses. Obviously, after that, we have to check and run them and see if this is the case. And if they have proceeded properly, they are included, not for this draw, right? But they will be included for the next for the next election. Guys, we got to reach 240. Uh, we don't want also to, to, to overload somebody with a huge amount of emails regarding the elections over every single country because the people get tired and then they 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 ignore us, right? Uh, expert contacted, uh, being, we sent an invitation and after that, uh, after one week or 10 days, we sent second, a second uh, reminder and then a second reminder, all right? So this is what, what, what we've been doing in the last month. Uh, the data you will see probably is gonna be almost 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 definitive but we still need to send the third reminder for a couple of countries coverage we have decided since the countries sorry since the project is going to include all the countries in the world that he, that held elections we have included all the elections that were celebrated from july to this to december 2012 uh, and this may have an effect again in the response rate we have included the can we have excluded the countries that have below 50,000 inhabitants which implies vanuatu palau all those small little countries. And we didn't have time enough to reach Sierra, uh, sorry, um, Timor-Leste, Libya, and Ghana, all right? But in the next batch, they will be, they will be included. We divided an election as Haidan Marinov. So a national executive election contest involves direct public voting for the person or party on the ballot, excluding the indirect voting by committee or institution, as well as referendum and plebiscites, which this probably will include this will go into exclude, sorry, China in the future, right? So we have to be very clear on, on what on what we are on what we're including. By for the paper and, and Ben probably has suffered a, a, a very worthy explanation. We were including uh, first round and second round elections for the next for the next uh, batch. We're going to include second round elections, all right? So because it, it's going to be easier for us first because second round may be useful as a proxy for the first round and second because we cannot be insisting on the on the experts constantly in order to, to increase response rate um, ideally we would like to contact at most our expert twice a year for two different elections but in some countries like sierra leone and right now you're going to see some of the some of the countries it's really hard to, to reach them sierra leone Senegal or Ghana or wherever. So it's likely that at some point, at most, some of our experts will get four emails per year to respond, which you may think that it's a lot, but you know, guys, I do a lot of surveys, a lot of internet surveys. It's, you know, everybody has its own hobbies. Mine is this one. <laughs> and I'm getting, <laughs> and I'm getting by, you know, some of the big companies, I'm getting like once, twice a week. So we're pretty cool on that. Now, obviously there are some things that since this is on the internet and it's very well, it's operated through Google Docs and it's the internet, we're just getting, um, we have to deal with some issues like, you know, what's going on with filters, what's going on with wrong addresses, what's going on with, um, what's going on with, uh, with the spam. The thing is, it's been already shown that internet, the internet uh, surveys get at least between 10 and 11 points below uh, telephone phone call just uh, response rate. So obviously this, this has been affected. But even that we got around 28%, which it's not hips, but it's not, it's not very bad. And this obviously has been very much changing from country to country, all right? Those are the elections that we have included in the pilot study, you just can read them. And this is which is more important, is the pool of, of experts that I was mentioning before. We have the domestic and the international. Again, uh, for the future, and this is something that we are aiming to, to I think we, we believe that we're gonna close it like that, is to have, try to get half and half, and if not, you know, 15 to 25 from each side. But again, it's really hard, it's not that it's really hard, it's simply that we are not able to find someone from Sierra Leona that, you know, that it's a domestic, because simply there, there aren't. And so in those cases, we have to rely on international and international sources, and international experts, and those is got what is going to be, right? Uh, in some other cases, I've seen we've, them, we've made them all domestic, but this is going to be, again, we want to try to get a fair coverage between domestic and, and international, between 15 to 25 for each side. 
These are our, uh, we got the, the overall response rate, this was at 28% overall. It will increase, as we said, just a little bit. And, but this response rate has varied according to the country, all right? So guess what? When you go to the Netherlands, we have a higher uh, response rate than in the Belarus, all right? But contrary to some other expectations, check Ghana, for instance, we get uh, a decent 33%, which it's not, it's not about, it's not about a man compared to Korea Republic, which you only get 20%, South Korea. All right, responsive. Now, which things may be affecting this is obviously that we are sent, as before I said, as the, 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 the time span, sorry, the, the spam filters. Um, but something that may also be including or maybe affecting is the time that we're asking for the election. So we're sending an, an email in 2013 asking about an election that happened in 2012. Our, AB, our belief, and this is just a hypothesis, that this rate will increase when we're gonna send in the next batch because we're gonna be sending up in a, within a month of the election. So once the if the election was celebrated in January, the email will be sent in February at the most. So at least the people will have a, a fresher memories in that thing and we believe that that will increase response rate. But you know, that's what we'll, we'll see. Great. Okay, so to now cut to the chase and start to show in, uh, some preliminary results from the uh, survey responses that we've gotten in so far. Uh, we have, I think, roughly 225 responses at last check uh, of experts that have uh, completed the survey. Um, and you can see here uh, a couple of the different variables that we included uh, <coughs> that range basically as an initial way of looking at the overall responsiveness and, uh, and uh, answers that people gave to particular questions. We, um, we turn them into 100 point scales of, of uh, uh, low integrity to high integrity. And certain questions scored uh, more towards the high end of the strongly agree that they did have integrity. Um, electoral procedures, how the votes were counted, and the regulations regarding party participation were relatively hi uh, highly scored as having more electoral integrity while issues of campaign finance and equal access to the media, you're more likely to get lower responsive uh, responses across all different countries. So we definitely see different overall uh, answers to questions, just cross-sectionally, aggregating all answers from all countries to get an overall snapshot that there is definitely different, um, different likelihoods of responding to particular questions over the lifespan of the electoral cycle as having more or less integrity. So this is an initial snapshot of the different uh, aggregated responses across different questions. However, there is a heterogeneity uh, between countries, right? Certain uh, experts responding to an election that happened in um, Burkina Faso is likely to be different than those in the Netherlands. So in looking at, um, an aggregated index, we basically summed all of our 40 odd, 49 odd independent variables uh, of different aspects of integrity. We summed their answers together and normalized it to 100 point scores. Questions that were phrased negatively, we reversed the scale uh, so that higher, uh, higher answers, fives instead of ones, are perceived as having a more legitimate process than ones that were ones, turning into a normalized 100 point score. And f to just kind of meet the face validity test, you see that those that are often considered as being consolidated democracies, uh, United States, uh, South Korea, Czech Republic is the one that was uh, tied with Lithuania for overall as having the overall highest average um, score for uh, integrity. While on the other side of the scale, you have Kuwait with a 42 and Angola with a 46. So overall, we definitely see variation in the scales. It's not that everyone's answering um, agree to all of the different questions. These experts are differentiating between questions as well as between countries that um, experts are responding in a way that kind of meet initial face validity tests for, uh, for external validity. What's important to kind of stress in our preliminary results and the kind of thing that gets me the most excited about what we're actually doing and about the, uh, about the pilot stage is when you 
So we have 11 different sections in the questionnaire that, that Ferran handed out that looks at different stages of the electoral cycle. You see that with a, the green scores are ones um, above 70, uh, the yellow are in the middle, and the red are the worst scores, that you see most of the red and the yellow earlier on in the electoral process, in the pre-election process, and in the campaign process. That the election day and the post-election, you're more likely to see, on average, uh, countries with a higher uh, perception of integrity for that part of the process. So you see campaign media and finance are problematic for a bunch of different countries across regions, um, Romania, Ukraine, Angola, Kuwait, that the, this campaign process is problematic. But then you also see how the electoral boundaries are drawn, as well as the electoral laws and voter registration also can be problematic. And that occurs uh, um, earlier than when normally election monitors and Jimmy Carter parachutes in in order to watch the election day process, right? So this shows that there is variation across the electoral uh, cycle, as well as a lot of the problems that our initial pilot survey tends to find are before um, most people have looked at to date, which is kind of interesting um, and encouraging. And also just being from the United States, you see that the US ranked remarkably low for how, uh, how, uh, how the, uh, the boundaries are drawn uh, for elections. Um, as being, uh, ha having integrity, not so much. The same with the, uh, the election laws. Kind of interesting. Kind of meets with, I guess it depends on the region. I'm from Louisiana, so um, <laughs> a, bit, a bit biased with that. Now, that kind of shows initial indications of internal validity, whether and a, as well as um, legitimacy and reliability, showing what we're telling us is encouraging compared to what we already know about elections that we've either lived through last November or that we might be familiar with. Um, the, the one important test of external validity is to kind of see how well our data are kind of matching up to existing indications of electoral integrity or malpractice that kind of exists. So what, what I did is created, use this, and, uh, this aggregate 100 point um, score of the different responses that we have so far and plot them against several well-known uh, indicators. The first one is Freedom House's seven-point scale of liberal democracy that we normalized uh, to a seven-point scale just for ease of comparability uh, and plotted them against each other. And you see, um, you see some clustering around particular areas, but overall, if it matched identically and there wasn't any differentiation between what we're measuring and what others would measure, it would lie on a perfect 45-degree angle. Uh, and I did include those in earlier graphs, but I thought it was a bit confusing, so I just included the fitted value ones. And for most of these, you see the fitted value is slightly lower than 45 degrees. So that, in some ways, is consistent with what we saw here, that they're capturing, and a couple of the other indicators I'm going to show later on, that if you're focusing on the voting and aftermath, you might uh, see a, a process as, as being more legitimate, as having more integrity than are in the indicators that kind of in show uh, additional problems that could occur well before election day. So you see uh, overall this fitted value flow um, being below 45 degrees. And one thing to look at uh, is you're going to see that Angola is a bit of an outlier and then that the Netherlands um, is basically ranked perfectly across different cases. But as we start to analyze these data and when we start to present them again, looking at outliers I think will prove instructive to kind of see what we're getting at. Is, is the scale a useful way of, of looking at overall um, integrity, different ways of weighting it, what's actually going on to making certain countries be potentially outliers according to our measure. So that was with the Freedom House scale of liberal democracy. Another one that we also, uh, and that's from the 2010 scores, which uh, I want to merge it in with the 2012 one so that they're comparable and related to the same direct election. Uh, Judith, uh, Judith Kelly's quality of electoral democracy, uh, her, uh, her uh, data rely on US State Department reports of the electoral process. And you see here, it's more of that 45 degree angle. And the, the responses are, are, are pretty well clustered. 
which is intuitive. I mean, they're not all over the place, and there is a relatively reasonable matching between how they're ranked on the quality of electoral democracy score as well as ours. However, what's most of interest to us, and as I mentioned in the beginning, this, uh, the electoral integrity's process at, of using mixed methods is to look at overall electoral laws and norms and see how well that matches to individual perceptions. One way that we might think about, okay, are we capturing something different, something that's uh, potentially useful from a research perspective, is to look at other individual level perceptions. So if other data sources are using international monitors or State Department reports, some other external kind of report that might be ignoring an electoral process, people who actually live in a country, whether experts or the population, their perceptions should theoretically match closer um, to each other than these kind of other indicators. So in some ways, the most direct relationship and the one that's uh, exciting to us initially is showing for the four countries that overlap, um, the other uh, data collection that um, Dr. Norris has undertaken with the World Value Survey is to add a couple questions into the World Values, the latest round of the World Value Survey. It's going to be 30 questions total. Uh, they have, I think, a preliminary results from 20 different countries. Unfortunately, they don't overlap um, with ours perfectly. We only have four countries. But the questions are worded exactly the same. They ask the experts the same questions as they do the, uh, the, popula the population, which is the most um, concrete uh, comparison of uh, experts' perceptions to the population to see if we're actually getting um, uh, measures that we might be able to use. And here, I mean, there really is uh, a good match between uh, in Ukraine, Romania, Ghana, and the Netherlands between individual level perceptions of just the general population as well as the experts. Of, uh, and we created a scale. This is four different questions that are aggregated in both. So this is, this is hopeful that we're getting uh, answers that are consistent between both the word values, mass, uh, mass perceptions, as well as expert perceptions. I created a bunch of other tables that are in the paper and other ones that I didn't want to subject you to as well, but those I think provide an initial overview of the questions. We can talk in the Q&A about uh, the variance uh, within questions and across questions. Uh, some countries' experts agreed on more uh, on some questions but not in others, but that gives, kind of gives a, a brief overview of our initial findings. Um, there's a lot of further work uh, to undertake. Again, this is, we've only been here since January 2nd, so we're still at a really early stage of this. So there's a lot of areas for future research, as well as um, we're aware that there is no research design that's perfect, uh, as much as we would like to be able to strive for it. And um, we do have a relatively small sample of 225 responses so far, as well as ideally 40 experts per country, but as you can see with a response rate of 28%. Certain countries are a lot uh, elicit better responses than others. I would say that our results are consistent with the number of experts in published research, so it's consistent with the overall sample size. Um, it's it's something you would always like to, to improve on, but it's a trade-off between time and, and, and results, as well as some might ask, I mean, we, are, we do live in an ivory tower here, right? To the extent that the experts that we find are representative of some kind of larger population of experts. The difficulty is trying to determine what a population of experts would look like within a particular country and whether that population would differ in countries like the United States or Sierra Leone, right? And so what we try to do through these different uh, techniques for trying to find experts is to try to make sure that the selection is representative given what we know about the country and the amount of hours that we spend trying to research them, but also try to get at um, a random sampling. And what's useful and what we definitely think of as an area of previous uh, for future research is to be able to control for any kind of systematic differences between experts. We have information about their background, what parties they voted for, uh, whether they played some kind of role within the electoral system, and we ask them more general questions in the vignettes. So there's different, definitely ways and a statistical means for trying to weight different answers according to what we know about experts. But that's definitely something we've, we're interested in doing in the future, whether we haven't had a chance to do now. Um, there's a bunch of new statistical tools I get to play with in trying to analyze these data. Um, one is factor analysis in trying to get at are there underlying 
um, concepts that experts are, are perceiving are occurring within different elections. We ran some preliminary factor analysis, um, not anything ready to be presented here, um, but there definitely seems to be a couple factors that they're loading on having to do with uh, electoral um, fairness as well as a couple other indications. But we'll definitely try to see if we have 49 questions, if some questions are loading uh, very strongly on the same underlying factor, then you could drop one because that basically the one that you're left with would be able to capture that. Um, the six vignettes that Fran mentioned earlier is a way to kind of get at what are the, the experts' underlying perceptions about what's most important to understanding electoral integrity. Gary King's anchor software, and he has a bunch of articles that are available online that basically <coughs> use methods to be able to weight people's responses given their underlying perceptions about the general phenomenon of interest definitely want to play around with that, as well as merge these data into country level factors to kind of explain why certain elections have integrity or not. And that would require having data at different levels of analysis. The individual expert respondent, the election characteristics itself for how high the turnout was, was there violence or any other factors that were relevant, how many parties ran or whatever, as well as overall country level factors that might affect uh, integrity, where the overall state capacity, this would require data across different levels of analysis, which re would require a more sophisticated technique of using multiple level modeling, and that gets to actually using these data to, uh, to try to predict these data, um, which is an area that we hope to get to in the future. And then fundamentally, try to think about theoretically what's, uh, it's always important to try to make sure that our measures, we're not just gathering data to collect data, but that these data serve a purpose, that it's a